Hi there, and welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk as we bring you In Search of Christianity. Uh, here being upstate New York and Dryden, New York, uh, on, this, on this particular eve. So we're just blessed to be up here with Bob and Pam Rizzoni, staying at home and ministering in this area, getting good fellowship with one another. So we're glad you can join us for this program. And I want to remind you before we start that you can join the conversation on Facebook at facebook.com slash in search of Christianity. And we'd love to have you participate as much as possible with your comments, your suggestions, your questions. So we're going to start tonight. We're going to, if you haven't seen last week's program about gardening, about going from the, the seed to the root to the fruit, you really need to see that. Um, because that's what we're going to do is we're going to kind of continue on in that and just bring that to its logical conclusion here. Before we do anything, I'm going to ask Brother Bob if you'd ask God's blessing on our time tonight. Father, we just thank you. And just before we started, I turned to the Word and I saw, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Amen. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Praise God. And Father, we just thank you for this night. We yes. thank you for this time. And we pray that your word would speak clearly to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. All right, so as I said, in the last program, we talked about going from a seed to the root of something to the fruit that it bears, all right? And I want to pick that up in this program, talking about the root. Repentance again. Now, repentance in the Bible, in, in the New Testament, the word is metaneo, which, which means to change one's mind or to think differently. Okay? Now, we always, you know, I think too often we put it in the context of, okay, I committed a sin, I got to. This is a transformation. It's a transformative thing, repentance, because it's training yourselves to think differently. To change your mind, okay? I've talked a number of times, uh, and you may have heard these, talking about Jesus coming forth in the resurrection, buried in a tomb. And when the apostles go to the tomb, Jesus is not there. But I've said this a lot of times, the tomb wasn't empty. There was something in the tomb. The clothes of death, the, the garments of death that had Jesus had been buried in, were still there. They were left behind as Jesus came out of that tomb. Mm -hmm. While on the other hand, Lazarus, like us, he was raised from the dead as we were when we were called by name. But he came out of that tomb and into new life, still wearing the garments of death. Which is why Jesus had to say, and the first thing he said is unbind him. So he came out with the old ways of thinking, the old habits, the old traditions, right? We do too. I mean, when you came into new life in Christ Jesus, yes, you were a new creation. That's a fact. Brand spanking. You have new life in Christ Jesus. But you know as well as I do, we carried those, that, that we were still wrapped sure. in those old habits. Right. Sure. Which is why we're commanded by the Word of God not to be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we might prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Romans 12, 2. We've got to be, we now, in our new life, have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Well, that's what, men, that's what repentance is. That's exactly what repentance is, to change one's mind, to think differently, right? And the goal of this, of course, is to have, now we have the mind of Christ, but if you're honest with yourself, you know we're not operating in the mind of Christ. And this is why we're constantly confronted with having to make that choice to take thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. But the goal that we should have, and this is God's goal in our life, is that we be conformed into the image of Christ and we become daily more Christ-like, right? Mm -hmm. Think about, I'm going to read to you from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, right? Have this attitude, this mind, 
in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now it specifically says, and we're, we're trying to have our mind transformed, there was, this is the mind we're supposed to have, the mind of Christ, and that's his mind. Denial of self, poor in spirit, humility, a bondservant of God. Simply put, the goal of our mind should get to the place where, like Jesus, we say, not my will, but thy will be done. And that is the complete opposite of natural man. All right? And we're going from seed to root to fruit. That's what I've been saying, right? I, I want to read you something, a verse I pray that you're familiar with. But I want you to think about this. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy, and he said, All Scripture is God-breathed, right? And profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All right, now, so think about that in terms of what I just said. The seed, the God-breathed word, yes. goes to the root. The repentance is teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness. That teaches us to think differently. And the fruit is for every good work. It's all in that verse. Amen. It's all in that verse. I mean, can you see that? Yeah. The whole plan is right in that verse. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about thinking differently. I have said so many times that if you want to learn to think differently, like as Jesus desires that you do, go to the Sermon on the Mount. Yes. Now, as a matter of fact, we did 29 hours of study, video study, on the Sermon on the Mount some time back, which is still up on Bible Talk. But realize that the Sermon on the Mount, this is the account of Jesus teaching his disciples, all newly committed to following him. This is in the beginning of his ministry, right? He's not teaching the crowd, and certainly not standing before the crowd, like you see in movies and pictures and stuff, right? It says he sat down and taught his disciples, right? These were the ones who had the seed, the word, already sown in them. Yes. Okay? Before we go, now think about this. This is not, the Sermon on the Mount is radical. It's going to demand that you change everything about your thinking. That's true. And yet, Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 and 30. So it's not, this is not something that's supposed to be a burden, not supposed to be difficult, right? And John wrote in 1 John, he said, For this, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Right. Get over the idea. Okay, well, this is impossible. I can't follow. I can't be like Jesus. Of course you can. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because you've got the same Holy Spirit within you. Of course you can. Now, these are the disciples, and, and they have to be taught corrected, and trained in righteousness by learning to think differently. Changing your mind. But it's important that you recognize the fact that this is like the first thing that Jesus does with them. He doesn't start sending them out and doing things. The first thing he does is to bring them and teach them to think differently. Yes. That's repentance. Mm. It's not, oh, I'm a very person, I'm a it's, it's, it's learning to think in the ways of God, bearing in mind that His ways are not our ways, so we have to be trained. You are righteous. That was the gift of God. You are the very righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's the truth. That's a fact. That's the Word of God. But you need to be trained in it. You need to be trained to walk in it. We all do. Okay, so the, the believers then and now must be taken from being religious to righteous. They have to be delivered 
from depending on rituals and brought into relationship. And this has to be, it has to take place in order that they would be equipped for every good work before he can send them forth. And he's sending them forth as a salt of the earth and the light of the world, that others might see their good works, our good works, and glorify the Father who is in heaven. That's exactly what he taught in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Mm. Now, I want to talk about the start of the Sermon on the Mount, how we have to train ourselves to think differently. Churches that we have been to all over the world, there seems to be such a focus on how can I get blessed? Do I got to plant this seed? I got to give money? I got to do this? I got to do that? The Sermon on the Mount starts with the blessings of God. And think about this verse from Deuteronomy. I'm going to read Deuteronomy chapter from the beginning of Deuteronomy 28. Now it shall be, if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments which I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. When you seek the Lord, his kingdom and his righteousness, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, you never have to seek the blessings. The blessings will always seek you. They'll overtake you. <coughs> they will flat run you over. Absolutely. So why is the focus in so much of the church today about how you can go out and seek the blessings? You're not supposed to seek the blessings. You're supposed to seek Jesus. You're supposed to seek the right relationship with the Father. It's backwards. It's backwards. Okay? Because Jesus came, he said, to bring joy-filled, abundant life. So this training in righteousness, this learning a new way to think, starts with Jesus telling the disciples about the things that will truly bless them. The Beatitudes. And those are so contrary to both religious and worldly culture. Absolutely. Think about it. I mean, they're so contrary. So let me ask you a question. Think about the people that Jesus picked. Now I know they, they, they were good to bad, but some, most of them, okay? These were good Jewish believers. They were probably very faithful and, and faithfully observant of the law. People were back in those days. I mean, you know, there's such a focus on the doing of the law. Why did they need to change their thinking? You know, why? Whatever the cause, the answer remains very simple, right? They thought wrong. They needed to change their thinking because they thought wrong. How many times did Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? He said, you've heard it said, but I say to you. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. They had heard it over and over and over from the religious leaders, the religious teachers, from the Pharisees, from the Sadducees, from the lawyers. They had heard this, and now Jesus is saying, now you have to learn to, to change your mind. So it's retraining. But they had seen it in practice. Mm -hmm. They had seen it so many times. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't be like the Gentiles. They saw it in the world around them. These were the things that, this is how we typically get trained by the religious leaders in the world around us. Mm -hmm. But now, Jesus is going to train us in righteousness. Oh, yeah. They had been trained by the religious leaders of their time, both by what they said yes. and by what they did. Yes. They had been trained by the Greco-Roman world around them mm -hmm. as to what prayer should be like mm -hmm. and about the importance of mammon. And it simply wasn't right thinking. Yes. They needed the word to repent to change their minds, to think differently, just like we do today. Absolutely. Yeah. Mark was reading a book the other day. That he, Mark and Alice and I had been together over in Jerusalem a few years back. And we have a dear friend over there, uh, a, a couple, a married couple. The fellow's from England and she's from France. And uh, they, they have a news broadcasting ministry from from Jerusalem, uh, which is, is very good. It's called In the Last Days. She, as I said, is from France and just has an incredible understanding of the Hebrew language and has written a book. Uh, and, and the title of the book is The Beauty of the Hebrew Language. Okay, 
just it's a great great book I don't, I'm not quite sure how you get it or well we can at the end of it you know what yeah I'll, I'll, we'll put it up on Facebook and search of Christianity or at the end of this you can post it I can yeah Alice says I can post it on here at the end of this <laughs> so I'll try and make a point to do that yes. but uh, she made a comment and and it was worthy of note she said that she had been she said I have been fed on replacement theology in different congregations sadly the church has been separated from its Jewish roots for ne nearly 2,000 years through the church fathers embracing Greek philosophy mm -hmm. Roman ways the Gregorian calendar and the loss of the Hebrew language all of them have twisted our thinking True. So when he said that the other day, I mean, it just said, oh, my goodness, this is exactly what we're talking about. It changed the way we think. Yes. The way, no, it changed the way we should think. Mm -hmm. And now we have to get back to that root. We need, and that's what it means sure. to, and sure. that's what it means to be radical, to get back to the root. One of the things you said, you started to know you really knew Spanish when you started to think in it. Well, I wonder if a language structures your thoughts. Oh, of course so it the, it absolutely the does. Hebrew language, which is yeah. God's language, would structure your thought in a different way yeah, than the English language would do. Yeah, that's, that's right, and that's a good point. But I want to I wanna say, and if you can understand this, the Word of God is a language. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, it, it is a language of itself. And that's the language that we need to speak. Does it not say that Peter, yeah, the Spirit, did, did Peter not get moved by the Holy Spirit to say, if any man speaks, let him speak as it were the utterances or the oracles of God? But you know, one thing she says in the book is the is Jesus and, and the apostles and the Pharisees spoke the Hebrew dialect. They they spoke the Hebrew. Well, Hebrew in the time of, of Jesus was the religious language. And it was typically only used for the religious ceremonies. And Aramaic was, and, and was the common language. And of course, Greek was the common language throughout the Roman Empire. But again, that's the world trying to remove yes. our, our connection to the Word of God. And you know, Hebrew was a became a dead language almost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's not until modern times that it was reestablished. And as a matter of fact, um, Natalie and, and Martin had a connection to, and I, I'm sorry, but it escapes me. What? No, to the fellow who, the, the Jewish fellow who was actually responsible for restoring and bringing back the, the, the Hebrew language as the common language. And of course, that is the language of Israel today, is Hebrew. Um, but because it, it indicates God's thought uh, clearly. And I don't want to get totally distracted, but it's really, I think it's worthwhile talking about the fact. Yeah, I always say that the two tools that you should have as you do your Bible study, in addition to your Bible, and that would be a dictionary and a concordance. Mm -hmm. and words are important. Yes, right. Okay, we've become very slovenly. We have become very careless in our use of, of words, and we're allowing the world to change the words and the meaning of words all the time. A concordance will show you, take you back to the Hebrew. You don't have to be a Hebrew scholar to be able to use those tools. And by the way, if you have a computer or an iPad or an iPhone or anything, now it's so easy to get really, really great Bible study tools mm -hmm. where you have all the different languages and you have, you have the Hebrew roots and everything right there on it. Use those tools. Use what God has given you. Because it, it reveals things that our English language doesn't oftentimes. Is it deep? We were talking about that today, you know. Bob, Bob and I were having a conversation earlier, and he was talking about Paul being a tent maker. And it, it literally said that, it, you know, it's a talit. That's part of the religious prayer uh, garment representing the word, right? And I was talking about when Paul went to Athens, and he was called by those wise philosophers of, of Greece. You know, they called him, uh, it's, I think it says, like in my, the New American Standard Bible, it says that he was a, an idle babbler. But what it literally says in the Greek that it was written in was that he was, it's an idiom that they used back then, that he was a remnant gatherer. Well, you, couldn't be, you could not have a better description of the ministry of Paul than being a remnant gatherer because he was, he was being used by God to gather up that remnant. 
And it's so neat to see these things. And there are so many places in Scripture where if you go into the Greek of the New Testament or the Hebrew of the Old Testament, you begin to see how important the words actually are. You know, Paul wrote to Timothy again in the first letter of Timothy, no, second letter of Timothy, chapter 2, and he said, study to show yourself approved unto God. It's, it is worth the effort for you to spend, not just spend casual time in the Word, but to get into the Word and study it and use the tools that are available. You know why? Because God wants to change your mind. We need to do this. If you've not spent time in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and seen what Jesus thought was so important to train the disciples in before they went out, before they went out into the ministry that they had, what? If it was important for them, and gee, why is it not important for you? Why is it not important for me? The Sermon on the Mount is the most radical, fanatical sermon ever preached. Amen. It is the most life-giving, life-changing sermon ever preached. Amen. Read it. Study it. Over and over and over. It's a living word. You can read it today and God can show you something more. He can give you deeper and greater understanding tomorrow and day after day. We need to have that commitment to the word of God. That is the seed that brings forth this root of changing our thinking that will allow our lives to begin to bear fruit every way. And by bearing fruit, we're not talking about you getting a better job. I'm not talking about you getting more money. I am talking about you being used to change lives, to, to be used for the kingdom of God. And if that's not your desire, you need to change your thinking. Amen. Amen. If your life is not about serving God, you need to change your thinking. If you're not spending time in the Word of God, you need to repent. It's true. Too much of the church today is too far away from the Word of God. And we don't have a biblical worldview. We look at the world around us and we don't, have a, we don't appraise it through the Word of God. And if you don't, you don't understand what's going on. You don't have a clue what's going on. And you'll be filled with fear. <clears throat> Absolutely. Absolutely. Why do you think so many people who call themselves Christians, who call themselves Bible-believing Christians, are filled with fear? You know why? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If you're not hearing the Word of God, you're not going to have faith. You're going to be, and you know what? There's, if you're not listening to God, you're going to be listening to the world. Absolutely. And it says in 1 Peter chapter, 1 John chapter 5, that this present world is in the power of the evil one. He's the one, the liar. A liar by nature and the father of lies. He's the one that's out there shouting. He's the one that's screaming and howling. He's the other one that's speaking. And if you listen to him, I promise you, it will give birth to something. It will give birth to fear in your life. Absolutely. Even David, a man after God's own heart, the apple of God's eye, a man so much of faith, he said, when I listened to the voice of my enemy, I was distracted and he was put into fear. Jesus said, be careful what you listen to. Amen. You know what you need to listen to? You need to listen to the Word of God. It Amen. is life-giving. It is God-breathed. When God formed Adam out of the dust of the earth, Adam lay there, he had no life in him. Until God breathed into him. The Ruach HaKodesh. The Holy Breath of God. The Holy Spirit. God wants to bless you. Like I said, I mean, you know, none of this is, nothing I say is forever for condemnation. I pray that God would use me to bring a word of correction. And encouragement. Because we need correction. I knew. Yeah. You know, if you don't get blessed by these studies, hey, that's between you and God. I promise you, I get blessed by it. Because it's the word of God. And I always get blessed by the word of God. Think about what I said. The first thing that he, the first thing that he does when he gathers his disciples is start talking to them, I want you blessed. Now the world says, boy, if you're rich, you're going to get blessed. Jesus starts out by saying, blessed are the poor. <laughs> Hello. If you're strong, if you're mighty, who's the meek, the weak? It's all, it is all different because his ways are not our ways. And if you're not listening to the word of God, if you're not going into the sermon on Mount, if you're not going into, you're not going to hear that and you're not going to change the way you think. The apostle Paul, who knew the love of God, said nothing could separate him from the love of God, who was transformed by the love of God. 
changed the way he thought. He had been devoted to the tradition of the elders, yes. to the law. Mm -hmm. And then he became devoted. Saul of Tarsus, that was him. Paul the Apostle, devoted to the Word of God. Yes. You know what he said? He said, we walk always in the triumph of Christ Jesus. We are more than conquerors. Can you honestly say that in your life? God wants you to be able to. God wants to bless you. He wants to give you this blessing that, that, this, that begins the Sermon on the Mount. It's not, it's not to make you some kind of poor, religious, unsmiling pickle face. It is to bring you joy. That's what he said. He wants you to have joy. He wants you to have abundant life. But he says, when, even when a man has abundant life, his life doesn't consist of his possessions. The world is telling you that life is about the stuff. And that's for the world. And Jesus is saying life is about the Spirit. Life in the Spirit. He wants to bless you, and He will bless you through His Word when you start to live His Word. And you'll never start to live His Word until you change your mind and start changing your thinking. You start being transformed by the renewing of your mind. When we started this Bible study, He asked me to pray. And I wasn't really paying attention. I just looked down. And I had read from Isaiah 55. Mm -hmm. And I had read to the point where it said, this is verse 6. But let me just read what it says after that. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways yeah. higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven, and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and I shall succeed in the thing, and it shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth. Oh, peace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's right. It's going to accomplish what he sent it for. He sent it to give you life. He sent it to give you joy-filled life. He sent it to give you abundant life. He sent it to change your life. He will accomplish that. Don't fight. Remember, he just wants to bless you. Hallelujah. God's good. You know, Jesus loves you. <laughs> he does. He loves you a lot. More, more than we can think or understand. I mean, you know, we really don't fully understand how immense, how grand the love of God is in our lives. But I pray that we grow in that knowledge day by day by day as he, as we are transformed, as we are drawn closer and closer to him. Well, hallelujah. I, I pray that you've been blessed here in our meeting in Dryden, New York. And by the way, we'll be here for another week. So next week, we'll be, we'll be back here again. Don't you miss it. Don't you miss it. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord God. Lord, that you brought us to this place, where you brought us to this time of fellowship, where you brought us into your word at this point. Lord, and we, re we rejoice knowing that you're the potter and we're the clay, and that you're molding us, you're shaping us, you're changing us. You are bringing us from glory to glory. Father, that you are conforming us into the image of your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. And we praise you and thank you Amen. for that above Amen. all. Amen. Well, it's been a blessing to be with you. It's been a blessing to be together. Until next time, may the Lord our God bless you to bits. Oh, Amen. Amen. Bye. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross The emblem of suffering and shame But I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain so I cherish that old